I'd like to welcome you to the first in a series of two Greek Week convocations. My name is Pete Permiani, and I'm Events Chairman of Greek Week this year. I'd like to remind you at this time that following the convocation, there will be a reception at the Alpha Gamma Rho fraternity. Everybody is invited to attend. It is now with great pleasure that I introduce to you Professor Jim Schwartz, who is head of the Journalism and Mass Communication Department here at Iowa State. Thank you, Pete. It was uh, some 25 years ago this summer that I first met our speaker for this evening, Mr. Clark Mullenhoff. He was a reporter of governmental affairs at that time for the Des Moines Register, and I was serving as a general assignment reporter for radio station WHO. Now, to anyone who was at all familiar with the reporting process, it was obvious even then that uh, Mr. Mollenhoff was headed for a distinguished career in journalism. He had the tough-minded, hard-driving approach that it takes to make a top-notch political reporter. In 1950, Mr. Mollenhoff was transferred to the nation's capital as Washington correspondent for Cole's publications. During the intervening years, he has covered every administration from Mr. Truman's Give Him Hell presidency to the one whose inaugural address some two years ago suggested that we lower our voices. Well, as you can readily see by looking at Mr. Molenhoff, he's what the Irish would probably refer to as a fine figure of a man. He's big. And let me assure you also that he's a bulldog of a reporter, an investigative journalist whose relentless monitoring of government has won him more than 15 top awards, including the coveted Pulitzer Prize, and no less than three Sigma Delta Chi National Awards. It's also interesting to note that Mr. Molenhoff was a college athlete, he is a lawyer, and in journalism, he's what Marshall McLuhan would probably refer to as a multimedia man. His awards have come for outstanding performance in newspaper, magazine, and television journalism, and for public speaking as well. Mr. Molenhoff was born in Iowa, educated in Iowa, was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard from 1949 to 1950, traveled in Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Russia in 1960 and 61 as an Eisenhower Fellow. For approximately one year, Mr. Molenhoff served as Deputy Counsel and then special counsel to President Nixon. In July of last year, he resigned that post to become chief of the Washington Bureau of the Des Moines Register and Tribune, the position he presently holds. He's the author of five books, one of them carrying the same title as that of his speech tonight. So it's my pleasure to present to you Mr. Clark Mullenhoff, whose topic is Despoilers of Democracy. Mr. Mullenhoff. Thank you, Jim. Speaking about Jack Shelley and those days back in Des Moines reminds me that uh, those were the days when hot pants was a state of mind uh, <laughs> rather than wearing apparel. I might say that uh, you spoke of me being a fine figure of a man. My, life, my wife would like to hear that. Uh, she thinks that I've taken on uh, quite a little extra weight since the days when uh, we were first courting around Iowa State, it was Iowa State College then, Iowa State University here. Uh, you may think that I'm beaming a great deal. It's because Jimmy Hoffa is gonna stay in prison. <laughs> now I don't like to, I, mean, I really don't like to beam this way because of the <laughs> ill that befalls a man, except if you really knew Jimmy Hoffa, as I've known Jimmy Hoffa over a period of about the last 20 years, uh, you would know that uh, organized crime really took a setback. And I might say that I was concerned about this. Uh, fact of the matter is, 
a good many of my colleagues were concerned about this. We were of the view that perhaps there might be some way that Jimmy Hoffa, with all the millions of dollars that he has, with that huge Teamsters Union that he has, would somehow convince someone on that parole board that he should be freed. As it turned out, all of our fears were for naught. Now, I might say that in this respect, too, the keeping of Jimmy Hoffa in prison represents a blow against organized crime. Jimmy Hoffa is and has been the embodiment of organized crime. And the organized crime division of the Justice Department in the last few days sent a memorandum of about 11 pages, I don't know how they kept it that short, to the parole board setting out his key role in the organized crime field. This is the Teamsters Union. If they'd let him go, this would have been turning their back on what I believe has been a magnificent start in the effort to bring organized crime under control. If you haven't been following it, there have been literally hundreds of indictments in the last two years, culminating with the indictment of Meyer Lansky last week. I think that uh, this demonstrated more than anything else to me that the administration really means business. With regard to the courts and with regard to organized crime, I think that the administration has done a complete turnaround and has demonstrated that it means business. There are a lot of areas where we could all quibble with things that the administration is doing. Uh, in Vietnam, I frankly say, I'm not sure they know what they're doing. I hope they do. Likewise, on things like revenue sharing, you can get two highly controversial sides of that. But when it gets down to the courts, gets down to whether it's the appeals court in Washington, D.C., the Supreme Court, or a wide range of other appointments, I think in, in this area is the strength of Richard Nixon. Now, this nation has gone through a period of disillusionment that's one of the most difficult in our history. Young and old alike have been questioning whether our system of government can deal with the problems that face our society. Scandals ranging from carelessness to outright fraud have been exposed in connection with war on poverty, our welfare programs. Evidence indicates that in certain areas, the mafia has a tight control over city, county, and some state governments, and in a few cases, there are congressmen that they control. There's even some ev evidence that the mafia has put the fix on the Internal Revenue Service in certain areas. Congressional investigations of Defense Department contracts demonstrate billions of dollars in cost overruns and indicate a negligence or a conspiracy to pad our military spending with excessive profits. There are examples of favoritism in the awarding of contracts at city, county, state, and federal level. The slang of Jake, Jack Yablonski, his wife and a daughter, has reemphasized the brutality that has been a part of the history of the United Mine Workers and many of our large labor organizations. Jimmy Hoffa's arrogant domination of the Teamsters Union, even from inside the prison at Lewisburg, has been probably the most dramatic example of this. Bobby Baker has been the symbol of corruption at the highest levels in our government, and I mean at the highest levels. It's easy to see why anyone who takes a brief look at some of these incidents in our society can be disillusioned. They question whether it's possible to operate our American democracy as it was intended to operate. 
in a fair and an honest manner. In the face of the problems that seem overwhelming, our citizens have reacted in many ways. Some have questioned whether we should expose scandals. Some go as far as to suggest that we cover them up so we can give a, the world a more flattering picture of the United States. Some people would withdraw into a shell of bitterness and a futility and leave the field clear to the active corruptionists. There are even a few who decide that if you can't beat the thieves, you might as well join them. Now, with no answers of their own, many people have rushed to join societies that contend they have the answers, and I do not mean Greek societies. These groups aggressively supply what the confused may regard as easy answers. The unknowing find it rather easy to join without thinking and find that they've become involved with the Black Panthers, the Ku Klux Klan, John Burt Society, Black Muslims, and no amount of warning and reasoning is going to stop all of this rush of thoughtless citizens from joining these extremist groups. A certain amount of this frantic joining can be expected in any free society. However, it is particularly disturbing when you see it happening around some of our campuses. Students who join the Black Panthers, SDS, or the John Birch Society can live with that particular record for the rest of their lives. It will come back to haunt them. It's equally disturbing when large numbers of college students rally around the thugs and the outlaws who disrupt the educational processes of our universities and take over and destroy buildings and offices. I believe there's a special responsibility placed upon the young people in our colleges to analyze what's wrong with our society, but to be restrained in their activities until such times as they are absolutely certain that they understand that they're being helpful, that they're not adding to the problem. And I would be hopeful that the critics of our society and our system of government would not seek to tear it down until what they replace it with is going to be something much better. For more than 25 years now, I've been involved in investigations and with a full knowledge of the corruption that takes over in this society from time to time, I'm still certain it's relatively clean. And I say relatively clean because we shouldn't judge this society against some ideal. We have to judge it by comparing it to other societies that exist in the world today. With all its weaknesses, it's certainly a better society than the communist world where there's no thought of fair play or justice. If there's anything wrong with our society, it is not because of our system of government. What's wrong is wrong despite our system of government, which gives the people of the country the right to insist upon high standards, the mechanism for defeating those who do not strive for honest and efficient government. If there are things you don't like, don't be among those who rip at the system and blame the American democracy for everything. It's time for each citizen to look at himself, to ask himself if he's contributing to this problem in some respect. He should also ask himself if there isn't something more he can do to eliminate the evils that will inevitably creep into every system of government. I believe that I viewed just about every evil that can creep into a system of government. And I haven't lost faith in this system. And I know that I never will. In nearly every case, the American democracy has faced a problem. They forced reform as soon as the facts were clearly relayed to the public so that they understood it in perspective. 
I have seen incompetent and corrupt city officials defeated and corrupt and incompetent county officials indicted. And I'm sure that that will continue to be the pattern if the press and the communications media generally are adequate to the job that we have to do in an American democracy. Now, arrogant bureaucracy is really the greatest obstacle today to the proper functioning of government. It creates a sense of frustration, a frustration from the lowest student up to and including the President of the United States, and I can say that from direct contact. A properly organized and staffed ombudsman office in your city, your county, or your state, or in your federal office can make government more responsive to the needs of the people. My experience as presidential ombudsman, coupled with more than 25 years of investigations, shows me that there is a way to move this government. Now, here's the way a governmental ombudsman should work. It should be a place for citizens to lodge their complaints against arbitrary bureaucratic action with the hope of having that grievance examined in detail. It should provide the mechanism for thoughtful, depth examination of complaints so that it can force the production of records. That's one of the big problems, getting a hold of the records you need to prove your case. Dealing with the government operations and the decisions. It should provide a means of separating legitimate complaints from frivolous complaints and should provide periodic publication of the findings of fact and conclusions. Reports published on a semi-annual or an annual basis would force government agencies to give greater attention to the necessity of justifying decisions to an independent body. Too often, they are only justifying to themselves, for they have the built-in mechanism for excusing their errors. The Ombudsman Office could be created at the federal level by the President within the White House, as my job was. Or it can be established independent of the White House, and I think that that has some advantages in being taken out of the political area. Essential to the proper functioning of this office are the following. This should be of a cabinet rank, so there can be no question about the Ombudsman's authority in the various departments. It should have a man of considerable experience, stature, and impeccable integrity. The job tenure should be such that there can be no doubt about the independence of the man holding the job. I would suggest that probably there be 10 or 15 lawyers assigned to, and accountants, assigned to this job. Public reports made to the President and to the Senate and to the House so nobody can bottle it up. Because if you get to making the reports just to one body, then somebody sits on it. This job should be devoid of any partisan political authority or responsibility. Now, the key to the successful operation is in the man selected. And I might say that just offhand, there's only one fellow that I can think of, John Williams of Delaware, who has the kind of stature, the nonpartisan integrity, and I might say he is plenty available right now, having decided not to run for the United States Senate and resting up in Rehoboth Beach. I believe that the establishment of an ombudsman office headed by Senator John Williams or someone like him 
would do more than any other single act to restore faith in the federal government. Expensive reorganizations, and we've got a lot of them suggested now, and realignments of government activities have been usually only a slight reshuffle of the same old bureaucratic cliques. John Williams and a reasonably small staff could be that independent needle that got some of these people moving. Now I might say, I do not regard this as likely development, for Senator John Williams is much too independent a man to be selected by some of the people who control some of the things in the White House. Many indictments and convictions followed the exposure of corruption back in the Truman administration when I was first in Washington. Revelation of conflicts of interest in several high offices in the Eisenhower administration resulted in a rash of resignations and indictments. There were indictments and conflicts of interest arising out of scandal, scandals in the Kennedy administration. This has been a constant problem without regard for political. The Nixon administration will be plagued from time to time with similar problems. There was one major test at a very early stage in connection with Major General Carl Turner. It was possible in that case to demonstrate the advantage of a swift and rather nonpartisan action that eliminated Major General Turner. It was possible to learn of serious problems involving Major General Carl Turner, who I might say was appointed by the Nixon administration in March 1969 as Chief United States Marshal. His resignation was obtained within a matter of hours after I called the Justice Department and told them what the problem was with regard to the gun transactions and with regard to a few other things where he had covered up for these swinging sergeants that we had at various service clubs around the world. The public was understanding of the Nixon administration in appointing him because the administration took action on this appointee at the first time that it became aware that there was something wrong. When Turner was appointed in March, there was no reason to believe that he was other than an experienced career official of the military. There was no arrest record, no convictions. The mistake of appointing Carl Turner was the mistake any administration could make, and there was public understanding of this and no editorial criticism, even from a lot of the press we're looking for some reason to jump all over Richard Nixon's back. Now, I had hoped that the incident involving Carl Turner would set a tone and that there would be a, a wisdom flowing from this to see that if you act quickly on your problems and you get rid of them, you're ahead politically. I must confess that the record since then has been a little spotty. We must all hope, though, that every administration will try to find out the true facts, to try to brush away the excuses, the rationalizations that are so frequently brought forward to cloud the issues. That is the only manner that these problems can be dealt with effectively. I was named as presidential ombudsman because Nixon wanted someone who would be mainly concerned with the problems of corruption and mismanagement and who could be independent enough to call these to the attention of the White House. It was not a role that carried any direct responsibility in the political area or in the program policy area. It stressed 
government operations as it should have. It was an effort to establish a mechanism outside the normal chain of command for the administration of government programs for independent fact-finding on problem areas that take across, go across the whole wide range of government. Now, in the last week or two, Mr. Agnew's been in the news again uh, with his criticism of this program on CBS, the selling of the Pentagon. I don't know how many of you have seen that. It's had quite a few runs at this stage. Let me know. How many people have seen the selling of the Pentagon? That's a pretty good. Now, I will make a judgment on it and duck. Uh, I think it's a very superficial film. It's one of the most superficial films I think I've ever seen. It misses two of the major points. I don't care how much the Pentagon spends putting out information. I just don't want them to lie to me. And the fact of the matter is, they do lie. But the CBS show never went into one of those lies. What was it aimed at? It was an ideological tome aimed at trying to cut down the Pentagon spending. Well, I want the Pentagon to spend enough money to protect us. But also, I want to be sure that they spend it on the best weapons for the best price. Now, in this respect, there was a good case to be made. The Pentagon wastes money. It buys second-rate weapons and pays the highest price. But CBS didn't say that. CBS was content to make this superficial drivel and pass it off as a great documentary. Now, in connection with that same thing, Spiro Agnew dealt with two other programs. One was Hunger in America. The point of Hunger in America was perhaps a, a pretty good point. I wouldn't argue with that at all. But how did it start out? It started out with the camera on a small baby, prematurely born, with a voice over saying something along the line of, you are seeing a baby die on camera. This in affluent America, that happened to be a lie. That baby was not suffering from malnutrition. That baby was the son or daughter of a young athlete from a Texas university and a mother about 18. No malnutrition at all. She fell down, miscarried, and this was the baby. And after they were caught with this, did CBS say we were wrong on that? No, they didn't. They proceeded to say, well, even if we were wrong, there was a baby someplace in America like that who died, and this was only symbolic. Well, that wasn't exactly the way it was pictured. And in this particular area, the networks are highly vulnerable. There was another problem involving Operation Nassau. This was the invasion of Haiti. You had a little ragtag group of people who wanted to invade Haiti. And they didn't have any money, no boats, no guns. CBS enters into a contract, an exclusive contract, for the filming of the invasion of Haiti. By the time they got through with it, they spent nearly $200,000. And boy, I'll tell you, that little ragtag group, they had guns and boats and you name it. CBS explanation was simply, but we didn't show it. But they damned well intended to show it. Now, those are areas 
And I might say there was a staged pot party out in Chicago. And there were House committees. These are House committees headed by Democrats and liberal Democrats like John Moss of California, who got on CBS on these things. And when John Moss, a liberal Democrat, is getting on the same things that Spiro Agnew is, CBS should just go back and take another rerun at this thing and go in and admit what the faults are and where the errors are. A House Commerce Committee, it's the Moss Committee, investigated the questions of whether a number of network shows were engaged in misrepresentations. The White House, I might say, had nothing to do with initiating any of those investigations. CBS had filmed a number of news shows indicating war atrocities in Vietnam while American supervisors were present. And this was another case. The Defense Department had the responsibility under the Geneva Conventions to make proper inquiry to ascertain whether atrocities were in fact committed for which they were responsible or American personnel was responsible. At the time this took place, it was right after melee. The Defense Department would have been negligent not to follow through when on national television you had an allegation of an atro atrocity. In following out that responsibility, the Defense Department on its own initiative did ask CBS if it would volunteer assistance in the identification of the alleged war atrocities. CBS officials declined to cooperate. They wouldn't say where it took place. They wouldn't say who it took place with. They wouldn't identify anything relative to the area. It's important to emphasize that the Defense Department investigations were of alleged atrocities involving American personnel and are not investigations, were not investigations of CBS. The correspondence between CBS officials and the Defense Department very clearly established this. The film shown on the Cronkite program on Thursday night, May 21st, for the first time included identification, this was after a point was raised on it, identification of a Viet Cong soldier as being a prisoner of war status. That film also disclosed for the first time the place of the battle, the unit involved, and other details not earlier disclosed by CBS. The May 21st film also disclosed that Sergeant Mott had taken part in 500 brush fire wars over a period of six years, and that the Viet Cong had murdered his wife and children. Now, this would not justify, but it would explain to a certain degree the rather brutal action by Sergeant Mott. Also, though, the second film by CBS included the statement that Sergeant Mott claimed his actions were in self-defense and that the man he killed was reaching for an AK-47 rifle. The Defense Department is in no better position than CBS to prove or disprove this. It is always difficult to reconstruct these matters many weeks and months later. The second showing by CBS gave the public a much better balanced picture 
of the actions of Sergeant Mott. It was unfortunate that CBS included an erroneous statement that in indicated that the White House was involved in the investigation. Now, I would like to see more effective criticism of government. But effective criticism must be accurate criticism where the governmental official can't jump up and say, but you're wrong on this and you're wrong on this. Although there has been considerable discussion recently about Agnew, I would want to point out that he is hardly the first public figure to have become involved in controversy with the press. In fact, it's often been said that the press and public officials are kind of natural enemies. While there are times when I would prefer that it not be necessary to engage in so much criticism, I think that uh, if we're fair, that this serves a good purpose. With all of its discomforts, it has been an essential part of our democracy from the time of Thomas Jefferson up to Ted Agnew. Now, Thomas Jefferson had a great deal to say about the press as a result of his years in public life. In 1813, he said, nothing can now be believed which is seen in the newspaper. Truth itself becomes a suspicion by being put into that polluted vehicle. Now, Ted Agnew didn't go quite that far. In 183, he said, Indeed, the abuses of freedom of the press here have been carried to a length never before known or borne by a civilized nation. Boy, but it is so difficult to draw a clear line of separation between the abuses and the wholesome uses of the press that as yet we have found it better to trust the public judgment rather than the magistrate, with the discrimination between truth and falsehood. And hitherto, the public judgment has performed that office with a wonderful correctness. And then, in 1787, he said, the basis of our government being the opinion of the people, the very first object should be to keep that right, and were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without government, I should not hesitate for a moment to prefer the latter. But something that's left off frequently when that is quoted is, but I should mean that every man should receive those papers and be capable of reading them. And he might have said, understanding what he read. All of those observations by Jefferson contain some truths which we can see. There is no real inconsistency in castigating the irresponsibility of the press, even as we concede that a free press must remain free as the greatest safeguard we have against authoritarian government. Several years ago, I gave the William Allen White address at the University of Kansas, and I scolded the press at that stage for irresponsibility, venality, general superficiality, and I documented every one of them. Those remarks were intended to stimulate the press to engage in self-analysis. I did not dare give that speech as a public official, for if I had, I would have incurred the wrath of many of my former colleagues. Now, today I might stress specific areas of press irresponsibility or partisanship, upon which a large number of newsmen would agree. Good sec sense dictates that I avoid uh, some of the specific criticism, for there are some who might question my motives in a few
few areas. Therefore, I want to make it abundantly clear here that I'm not attacking the press as a whole. I'm here to praise the press, really, if you hadn't caught it at this stage. I'm here to pra praise the press and to reiterate my belief that a free, independent press is the only safeguard against authoritarianism. Now, a totally balanced press is not possible because this business of balance is in the eye of the beholder. Since there can be no agreement on true balance, I must say that I would prefer that the press make its errors in the direction of being overly critical. This is preferable to the non-critical reporting that is too easily viewed as an indication that the press has become captive of the government. And I might say some of these networks, on the one hand, they engage in an ideological fuss with an administration, but they do not do the hard digging work to prove the frauds because there's always somebody in there, in their Washington bureau, who wants to keep that kind of lovely rapport that gets you into the White House for those specials. Uh, it used to be Lady Bird or Jackie. Uh, they don't have much to do with government. But the fact of the matter is the networks in one area are selling their birthright for that kind of non-governmental exclusive. Well, I'm understanding of the ways that errors creep into print, I can only hope that the press will have the good conscience to correct factual errors and the fairness to change opinions that have been based upon those errors. The truth is rather difficult to find, and the longer I'm at this business, the more this becomes apparent. It's difficult to know if you have found it or if you found only a little small piece of it. While recognizing the difficulties of search for the truth on any subject, we as reporters, editors, or public officials must keep certain principles before us. It is helpful if we start out with accurate facts. It's very helpful. Now, this is kind of a radical. Uh, if you had a sports writer, and he didn't even have the score to the game right, you wouldn't have much faith in him. But when we get off into the field of political ramblings, we find uh, many instances where they don't even start with the facts right. Now, diligent pursuit of facts and thoughtful, balanced reporting are needed to deal with the great problems we have before us today. Field of defense, social welfare, ecology. All of these are complex problems. Inaccurate and irresponsible reporting can only create greater confusion and make it more difficult to get solutions. I'm not suggesting that there should be less aggressiveness on the part of the press nor am I suggesting that there should be less criticism. Every effort must be made to point out the waste and mismanagement of our defense programs, but it must be done in the interest of creating a stronger defense establishment, not tearing it down. There should be every effort to avoid statements that can aid those who would seek the destruction of our defense establishment. Our welfare programs must be geared to eliminate poverty, but there must be the greatest concern for all evidence of corruption or mismanagement that takes the money out of the hands of the poor. Until we get that corrected, we're not really going to go very far. And we've got situations in New York City and a good many other places in this country where they're paying little or no attention to the millions and billions that are being stolen. We must give attention to the important job of administering welfare programs in an honest manner. 
as we do to reporting the details of poverty suffering. If the press and the government fail, then it will mean that more billions will be wasted, as have already been wasted in our scandal-ridden poverty programs. The effort to control our environment is vital. President Nixon, like a vast majority of Republicans and Democrats, is dedicated in a general way to a clean environment. He is also ded dedicated to achieving practical programs that will make those goals possible. Now, but he is affected by the kind of furor that's stirred up by critics who do not have a balance. Now, we must control the despoilers of democracy. These are the polluters of the land, water, and air, while keeping the corruptors of democracy from turning new government controls into new tax-wasting rackets. It's not difficult for any of us to support the dream of a beautiful and clean land. This is one of the easiest goals to get an agreement on that there is. There is a need to recognize, though, that every new law and every new function of government that carries the promise of a better life also carries the possibility of more repressive regulation and corruption. As any student of local government knows, the laws to license a restaurant are essential to protect the food of the place. But they are often simply the opening wedge for some new payoff rackets. And I would suggest that you, if you don't have them around here, that you take a look at some of the racket hearings involving Washington, New York, and Chicago. Realistic laws and honest administration of those laws are a benefit to man. Poorly drawn laws and lax or dishonest management can be simply one more drain on the tax dollars that sets the stage for corruption and even more disillusionment. Most businessmen, indeed I believe most citizens, will cooperate if they believe that the laws are being administered in a fair manner. Most businessmen, indeed most citizens, will balk at the prospect of more laws that simply infringe upon liberty and hold only the faintest prospect of improving conditions. A cynicism flows from the shattered promises of unrealistic laws poorly enforced or corruptly administered. Hope for a better America can only come from the realistic laws and from consistent, fair enforcement of those laws. That hope must be based upon the credibility of good government. Now, not perfect government, but reasonably fair and honest government. That's the only true goal of our American democracy, and that's the only way to achieve a fair play. That is the only road to a realization of real programs to control our environment. Government officials must be dedicated to honest administration, but with a government as large and complex as we have today, government officials must have the help of the press and the Congress. That help should be in the form of a constant prodding for better performance by a tough and an informed citizenry. America cannot stand the luxury of a sloppy, ill-informed, or lazy press that fails to criticize what it should criticize. America cannot afford a press that's provably inaccurate provably venal, even when occasionally it launches the best-intentioned crusade. You can't look for miracles in solving the big problems before our nation today. There are no slogans that can provide the money for the poor, 
or the machinery to assure that the money or service get to those who need it. There are no bright and imaginative new initiatives that can assure us peace with a communist world, or even peace on a, with a temperamental, aggressive nation of the non-communist world. There is no new law and no new body of laws that can stamp out the lawlessness of the Black Panthers, the Ku Klux Klan, or the Mafia. At best, new laws and additional police can only provide a few tools and a few solutions until they're placed in the hands of thoughtful, experienced, bright, and above all, honest law enforcement officials. The increased size of the police force and the new laws would be simply another repressive force and another source of disillusionment if they are controlled by dishonest men who do not understand the importance of fair play and honesty in government decisions. If there is to be order in our schools, in our cities, in our nation, and in our world, there must be an understanding of the importance of honest government. There are people who talk about this cynics. He's just for honest government. There must be the belief that in an overwhelming majority of the cases, crimes will be punished and good citizenship rewarded. In our democracy, the responsibility to see that crime is punished and good citizenship rewarded is placed squarely upon your shoulders as citizens. Students now, and as citizens and parents, you're going to have the responsibility to carefully analyze the actions and the statements of public officials. You have the responsibility to ask yourself if to you officials are sincere in their pronouncements, as well as practical in their solutions. You may be able to recognize that many men are thoroughly sincere in criticizing the institutions of our society, but are only destructive if they do not recognize the practical needs for alternatives. Many men have reason for bitterness over unfairness, unfair treatment at the hands of those who have used the authority of government. But the solution is not found in the destruction of the government or the chaos that would ensue. It's your responsibility to pay attention to the important details of government operations and to make the balanced judgments on public officials that you expect of them in their decisions. It's your responsibility to avoid the sharp ideological hang-ups of the far left or the far right, and to judge each case and each official on the details of honesty, fairness, and competence. It's no virtue to wander around in the middle of the road, either, with no opinions and with no desire to get the facts necessary for these judgments nor is it responsible citizenship simply join the Republican Party or the Democratic Party and simply pull one lever as an act of party loyalty at each election. Your party will be a better party and your party officials will be better party officials if you're a little discriminating in the way you cast your votes. Now it may be difficult from time to time to judge the honesty, the competency of competing officials. However, it's your responsibility to vote against those who are clearly incompetent or dishonest, for they are the despoilers of democracy. Your lack of attention to detail is the greatest asset there is for the public official who's incompetent, superficial, or dishonest. Likewise, your attention to detail is the greatest support that an experienced and dedicated official can receive. There are some who contend that a $200 billion government is unmanageable. 
They may even argue that the American democracy is ill-suited to manage such a government in a reasonably effective manner. If you have such doubts, just look at the alternative, the efficient authoritarians, with a total lack of concern for fair play or the rights of the individuals. Simply contemplating that alternative should be enough to stimulate your interest in doing all you can to make our government operate more effectively. Now, if our public officials are to have credibility, they must have practical idealism. They must strive to measure up to the idealism that I found a few years ago in an early teacher, an idealism that I tried to catch in some poetry. I think it must be the goal of men in government, men in the communications business, and others today as we contemplate the job of teaching and inspiring young people of this nation. And this is it. You are the molders of their dreams, the gods who build or crush their young beliefs in right or wrong. You are the spark that sets a flame a poet's hand, or lights the flame in some great singer's song. You are the gods of young, the very young. You are their idols by profession set apart. You are the guardians of a million dreams. Your every smile or frown can heal or pierce a heart. Yours are 100 lives, 1,000 lives. Yours is the pride of loving them, the sorrow too. Your patient work your touch make you the gods of hope that fill their souls with dreams and make those dreams come true. In meeting the great problems that face our nation today, practical idealism can be the salvation. Either a cynicism or a thoughtless ranting can only bring destruction. Thank you. Thank you.